really disappointed. <laughs> Um, I don't know what you were doing in 2016, but I was busy feeling a bit smug about some of my life decisions. Um, I had decided to give up social media entirely, because I was done. And to be fair to me, I hadn't even ever looked on Instagram or Twitter, but Facebook for me had become a total waste of time. I was sick of the hours of scrolling that I was getting drawn into, of looking at someone from schools, cousins, kitchen renovations for hours. <laughs> Although I've got some great ideas for tiles. Um, so I was done. I just deactivated all of it. Um, and I felt great. I felt, I felt clear. I felt present. And I think I was probably more than a bit annoying at how evangelical I became about my decisions. Um, something else happened in 2016. Um, my partner, Greg, had been having some stomach aches. And this was totally normal, because he'd been having stomach aches for five years. And he was under the care of a GP, and it was IBS. So this was just something else to ride out. This time was a bit different, because he was actually vomiting with the pain, so bad that I ended up calling an ambulance. And so we went to hospital, and we felt good, because actually people, people were doing stuff. The NHS was working really well. We felt happy with what was happening. He had some scans. He had an enormous shot of morphine. <laughs> um, uh, and, he, and we were happy with what was happening. But it's weird um, what happens just the moment before your life changes forever. It's not always how you think it's going to be. It, it might be that you're talking about the price of sausage rolls, or you're reading aloud a romantic story from a trashy woman's magazine. Because that's what happened to us when a surgeon walked in and told us that Greg didn't have IBS. He had stage four bowel cancer. And everything changed. Um, I don't know. People, people don't know how to deal with really hard news that's delivered. And, and we don't know how to deliver that news forward. So, for us, we started with phone calls, and for me, I phoned my parents, I phoned my brother, and they were just this mess of crying and tears and anger, and that in itself was, was another form of trauma for us. The next wave of communication came through text message. We, told, we sent a text to people to tell people. And this might sound a bit odd to people that maybe haven't been through a trauma, but in reality, it actually works as the perfect vehicle because you can deliver the news from a distance and, and not actually see how that bomb goes off for them. The next wave we told people through social media. So this was the time that I reactivated my Facebook account. And while our daughters were in bed, Greg and I sat next to each other on the sofa, and we wrote out our individual messages, and we chose an appropriate picture. Um, but, you know, what's an appropriate picture of, hey, um, haven't been here for a while. Guess what? Greg's got stage four cancer. Um, this was what I chose. Um, and we sat next to each other and pressed send. And then the beeping started. And the beeping didn't stop for months. We were absolutely inundated with messages of love and support. And it's, it's strange how that love is very tangible through such a tiny, tiny screen. What people didn't know, what we didn't tell them through Facebook, 
was that behind the scenes, it was starting to become clear that the kind of ca cancer that Greg has, the treatment that we need wasn't available on the NHS. Um, a friend of mine had sent me a message through Facebook that was supposed to be this great success story. And on the face of it, yeah, it was a success story. And believe me, cancer is all about the success stories. Um, and this article was about someone who had terminal bowel cancer and he was in remission. And I was thinking, great, this is excellent. And at the end, the last line was, if I didn't have private health care, this treatment would have cost £100,000. And I felt sick. Um, because we don't have private health care. And we don't have £100,000. So I did, I would say, the most vulnerable thing I have ever done in my life, which is I started a GoFundMe campaign to raise money for Greg's cancer treatment. This sat very uncomfortably for me because I come from a very working class background. I've had a job in one way or another since I was about five. Um, uh, I was always taught to live within my means and to work for what I wanted. And here I was asking for money through social media. And that was a very, very big move for me to put myself out there with that. So I did the same as I did with Facebook. I started an account, I sat and wrote my blurb, I chose an appropriate picture, crossed my fingers, and I pressed share. And luckily, so did a lot of other people, 24,000 people in 48 hours also pressed share. Um, my campaign went viral in the first day and raised £100,000 in 48 hours. The total currently stands at 200 and, over £210,000 and at that point was the most successful GoFundMe campaign in its history. It's, um, it's a strange feeling to witness your life being played out in social media across the world, across lots of different media platforms. But I was so thankful that we saw people's hearts and good nature through social media. And it is only through social media that the campaign went viral and we were able to raise this money for Greg's treatment. I was so heartened by seeing this, that it gave me the courage to start talking about other really vulnerable areas to do with Greg's cancer. We, we started to realise that cancer has a very certain nature to it. It's, it's almost like the Voldemort of illnesses. The, the name of it has as much power as the illness itself, and it's talked about in very hushed tones as if whispering is going to lessen the impact of it. And I certainly found that when I, I whispered Greg's diagnosis to my mum and dad. It was harder just to, to say it out loud. I, so I started to talk about things to normalise them, because we don't talk normally about cancer. We're terrified of it. We're terrified of the effects of it and how it would impact our lives. And I talked about things that, on a normal day, you'd probably go to great lengths to try to hide from people. So I spoke about sitting in a queue in John Lewis, sobbing while my baby screamed and screamed in her pushchair. I talked about sitting in my dog's basket while I was having a panic attack and hid from my children while they were screaming. I talked about how when Greg was diagnosed at the hospital, I would come to my parents' house every night 
and take sleeping pills with a bottle of wine and then have to sleep in a fetal position in my mum's bed with her. I talked about how I vomited an entire bowl of mushroom soup back into the bowl in the hospital restaurant next to a table of very attractive doctors. <laughs> <laughs> I talked about some of the weirder things that I've seen in the oncology units. I sat and sobbed on the lap of a, of a man wearing a fluorescent vest saying, cancer fucked with the wrong man. <laughs> um, while he was having chemo pumped through his veins and his wife was stroking my head, telling me about her first husband who had died from cancer and probably her second was just about to. <laughs> um, Social media gives us this very strange platform to create these impossible avatars of self, to live up to these Frankenstein versions of ourselves is, is an enormous pressure. And we create these, this digital armour to protect ourselves, to give a certain view of ourselves. And while that can protect us, it can also really weigh us down. And it's really easy to want to crave someone else's life when yours is just being utterly smashed to pieces. I didn't want to create any kind of pity party for myself. But I found that actually by talking vulnerably, it wasn't pity that I received from people. It was actually empathy and connection and it attracted like-minded people. So I carried on. <laughs> and I ended up talking about stuff that wasn't even necessarily about cancer. Um, I had previously been a full-time working mum. I was a fashion academic. And I suffered from harrowing morning sickness with my second pregnancy. I was also trying to run a course. I was also a mother to a toddler. And I was also trying to care for my partner who was becoming mysteriously more and more ill. I just struggled on with these things because I was a fully paid up member of the strong independent women, just doing it all, got it all, um, which was rubbish. <laughs> um, so what I did instead of talking about it to people, I would just cry in team meetings or I would just vomit in my mouth while students are presenting their work to me and swallow it because I didn't want to tell anybody. Um, and I would go home at night and I would cry myself to sleep because I had no idea how to spread myself any thinner. I suffered from postnatal depression for five months after my second daughter was born. And I did this in silence because I was so scared to be vulnerable and to say pe to people, I'm not really coping with this very well. Um, and that was a revelation for me that you could actually just say, this is a bit hard. <laughs> um, I'm not doing so well today. I really could do with some help with this. And I realised that actually the opposite was true for me as a woman of like, not just being signed up to this gang of going, I can have it all, but actually to say, I can't do it all, was the most empowering thing I had ever said as a woman. And for me, talking about this stuff, online, I started to receive lots and lots of feedback from people, not just friends, but strangers, about how I was maybe having a positive impact by talking about certain things. One story in particular really, really stood out to me. Um, Greg had made a very flippant comment to me on New Year's Eve about saying, if I regret anything in my life, it is that I didn't dress like Mark Bolan every single day of it. <laughs> and 
I was like, yeah. <laughs> yes, why are we not doing this <laughs> every day? So I went out and bought um, some glam rock silver boots. And I posted them on New Year's Eve saying, hashtag, wear the silver boots. <laughs> because who knows how long we've got. And a few months later, someone called Laura contacted me and said, that message that you wrote, I shared it with all my friends. And... We were like, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, we're going to take that on as our mantra to do things that scare us and push us and live the best life we can. And she sent me some messages that they've been um, sharing to and from different social media platforms about the stuff they've been doing. They've been to Ibiza on a child-free holiday. <laughs> I wish they'd have invited me. <laughs> um, They've, um, they've learnt to skateboard. They have done a piano recital in front of an audience. They've gone back to college. Um, so humbling to think that something so tiny that I had said made such a difference to somebody, that something so good could come out of our bad. And there are good things that have come out of our bad situation. Me Talking Vulnerably has led to me being given a weekly newspaper column. And it's given me the courage to start my own website, Beneath the Weather, where I get to write about hard things that are happening to me. I've joined Instagram. Uh, <laughs> after all my virtuous... Uh, <laughs> bad-mouthing of it. Um, and I've met these fantastic people, this amazing group of people in the cancer community who are um, dancing on tables and drinking margaritas and losing their hair and being pumped full of chemo and poison and doing it all. And we joined together and created the Fuck Cancer Club, which is a place where we get to talk about all of it in a really vulnerable, authentic way, and we support other people going through cancer as well. Having cancer is, is just the hardest thing. I thought being a mum was, but um, having cancer is harder. They, they say it takes a village to raise a child, and I think it takes a city to live through cancer. And I constructed my city through social media. And maybe I didn't need it. Maybe I didn't need those platforms. And maybe I could have learned to be vulnerable and to ask for what I need in a different way. But for me, that was where I learned to do all of those things. I learned that there is so much joy to be wrung out of life and to live for and to live now because ultimately that is all we've got and we can't avoid our own personal tsunamis but we can definitely find a way to enjoy the moments between the waves and knowing that makes me want to talk more listen harder care what people think less, and always wear the silver shoes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. That's worth a few rounds of applause.